Let's get to the to the uh, other side of the street here, the AEW program this past Wednesday night, because there's big news going on. None of it's on television. Not a lot of big news on TV, but there's big news going on in the company. And uh, there was an element of tip-off of that in the first segment on the TV program with uh, our returning champion. Finally, he's back. Luck Mussolini with an annoying hangnail. Here comes Punk straight out of the box. And he's got a live interview and he gets the big CM Punk chance. They're in Charleston, West Virginia. The uh, the home of Tudor's Biscuit World that people are up and they're ready to go. And there was not a lot of time wasted on this, Brian, because he took the microphone. He gave the initial happy talk connected with the audience, and then sat down cross-legged in the middle of the ring and challenged Hangnail Adam Page to a rematch right here, right now. Let's go. And nothing happened. And no music. And Jim Ross is like, do we, do we know if Hangman's here? And Punk waits, and nothing happens. And then Punk gets up and says, that's not cowboy shit, that's coward shit. And then he says, let me give you some advice that I suggest you take. And that was a very key word. Let me give you some advice that I suggest you take. The apology must be as loud and public as the disrespect. And if anybody else back there has a problem with the champ, come on down. No takers. It was not written in the format for there to be any takers, and nobody got froggy and jumped. Should we talk about the rest of the promo, or should we delve deeper into this now? Brian, what do you think? The punk hangman stuff? Yes. Yeah, because I guess the second part of the promo is a whole different thing, so we should probably, if we're going to talk about it, talk about it here. Okay, so apparently, from what we are now hearing from a variety of sources, including people on Twitter and even Uncle Dave, who we know has the the pipeline over there in that company, a lot of people started out, well, what, what the fuck was that? And they, they heard that Punk went into business for himself, that Paige was never scheduled to come out, that everybody was shocked and amazed that... Uh, that he had said that because nobody knew anything about it. And as well, they were starting to say, well, he's unprofessional for doing that because it buried old hangman, buried Adam Page. But then some more details started coming out, and I started seeing this yesterday on Twitter, and then Uncle Dave has a report on it in this week's Observer, I guess. I'm not going to... They're long sentences with not a lot of punctuation, so I'm not going to read the whole thing, but summarizing and the Reader's Digest version is apparently, remember, Brian, when Page and Punk were in the main event of the pay-per-view earlier this year, Punk was about to beat Page and win the title, and they had a live interview on Dynamite, and at the time, we said, what in the fuck was this? Did, did they have something that they thought Paige was going to just be great at delivering and, and he just melted down and botched it all? Or did he, was he turning heel in the middle of the ring, accusing Punk of, you know, being all of this and that, and we got to protect AEW from you? It was something that, the shit he was saying had no bearing on any of the way that this match or any of these people had been presented, and it was speaking in riddles, and one of those deals where the smart fans are going to know, but everybody else thinks this guy's a raving, you know, just gibberish. And we even said, was was he trying to turn heel, or did he just not realize he was doing it because he sounded like such a whiny little bitch? Yeah, even the smart fans didn't know. Yeah, well, apparently. That was Paige doing the same thing to Punk. Going off the, the beaten path, off the topics that had been discussed in order to take up for his company and his friends and the people who started this revolution because there was also, there was something 
Page did an interview somewhere recently, and it was excerpted on Twitter and on the internet, where they asked, well, with all of the veterans and the great stars of the past and the you know, the people who have so much experience in this business like Jim Ross and Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard and Mark Henry and this guy and that guy, does Paige ask them for advice? And he said, well, they may, uh, yeah. they may give me some advice every once in a while. Yeah, I guess I'll listen. But really, I don't think I need to ask for advice from these people because I'm part of the movement that started this company and this revolution, and I've, we've done just fine, so do we really need that advice? Yeah, you butterfly jean-wearing dipshit, you really do need the advice, or elsewise, if you'd taken it, you might actually be over now, instead of a whiny little bitch. So he said that, and Punk's verbiage was, let me give you some advice I suggest you take, so apparently, not only does Hangnail tell everybody he doesn't like to take the advice of people that are smarter and more experienced than him, but maybe he hadn't been taking advice from the guy that's trying to get him over working with him, because it's not the opposite. I believe I'll paraphrase a line from Mr. Punk. Punk didn't have to work with Paige. Paige needed to work with Punk to get in a main event that he deserved. And then if we find out that Paige was doing the same thing that they have accused Mr. Punk of here this week, being unprofessional by going into business for himself, and that was before, this was a TV promo where Punk expressed a few opinions and then went on to the meat of the matter, his opponent, John Moxley. When Paige apparently went to business for himself with his inexplicable rambling that he wasn't talented enough to pull off to where anybody would get it, that was before the main event of a pay-per-view. As I recall, that was one of the bigger houses, gates, and overall revenue-producing nights in the history of the company. And this fucking jack-off is out there trying to make up his own shit that he's Let's put it this way, not as he not only is Adam Page not a lyrical wordsmith, he can barely fucking read the cue cards. So he didn't need to try to be jousting with Punk anyway. And that's why I think Punk looked so confused when he was doing it because they had to have a plan when they went out there and it had to make sense or elsewise they wouldn't have gone out there until it did as long as Punk was involved. But when old hangnail bows up and starts doing a bunch of shit that doesn't make any sense how is punk good is he going to be unprofessional and say you know you just you just said a bunch of shit that i don't understand and you're not supposed to say so i don't know what to say back to you because you're a fucking idiot what's he supposed to do he's trying to sell a pay-per-view they're lucky enough to have a mainstream wrestling star that hasn't degenerated into a parody of himself doing song and dance routines over dinner and constantly changing his gimmick and latching on to other people to help buoy his sinking career. They've got a money generator, CM Punk. And they've got a entitled, whiny, fragile, not susceptible to advice or criticism, little cowboy. Cowboy, want to be a cowboy, baby? with my butterfly jeans and my pink t-shirt. Cowboy, babe. They're grating on each other is what we're trying to say. And there's no leadership in this company. We've talked about that every week. Tony will not put his foot down because Tony don't have a foot. He's got a couple of chicken feet. He's got claws. So now it's all breaking down. And you got the people who are in the business to do business and make money and get over and or fucking sell tickets or whatever, and you've got people that got in business to take a billionaire's money because they think they're talented for some unknown reason. Somebody has convinced them they know what they're doing, and they now want to get all their friends' jobs. And if their friends don't have jobs or jobs that they want them to have, then they get mad, and then they hijack the program 
to petulantly fucking protest. Have I summarized this approximately from what we're hearing now from Uncle Dave and a variety of people about this situation that now has come to a head, but has been simmering for a while? I guess so, and I want to make a statement, so I'm going to just reiterate it for a second. The go-home promo, the face-to-face promo before the pay-per-view, where Punk won the AEW championship, Adam Page decided on live TV with the biggest star in the company opposite him to whatever you want to say, go off script, even though there's not really a script, but he decided to go into business for himself. He went rogue. He was the rogue cowboy. (laughs) And CM Punk, to his credit, played it off perfectly. I don't understand what you're so mad about because he didn't understand what was going on at the time. Right. We're now led to believe, we'll talk about this in a little bit, that it was apparently Adam Page taking up for Colt Cabana. (laughs) But let me ask you this. A a bigger thing I'm thinking, and maybe I'm just thinking as a businessman here, even though I'm not a promoter, but Adam Page, right before this big pay-per-view, does this on TV live to the biggest star in the company. He's lucky Punk would do business with him at the pay-per-view. I wouldn't have. Yeah, well, here's the thing. when you double cross somebody on live television to try to get the advantage whether it's verbal or physical how do you ever trust that person again and so yeah i if if that's the case if punk had wanted to make a fucking issue out of it he could say well you know what the motherfucker the little weasley bastard that nobody ever heard of two years ago he double crosses me on live national television who's to say he's not going to double cross me on live national pay-per-view so fuck you tony Get a replacement for me because I'm the money match, not the fucking idiot that you thought would be a good champion because he spent two years tap dancing with Twinkle Toes. So, that again, what? where do these guys get their balls from? Who do they think they are? They don't have a firm grasp of their status in the community or in the wrestling pecking order. They think they're over because Tony Khan doesn't tell them what to do. But when they get talent out there that does know what to do and they can't follow instructions, they need to either follow or get the fuck out of the way. But I guess we got Paige out of the way for right now. So apparently we'll, we'll see what happens. If, if Paige is a cowboy, let him bulldog punk. You know, a lot of people say, well, Punk proved he couldn't fight in the UFC. Well, he's had two more fights in the UFC than Adam Page has, which is two. And he's done the training, and he's got a little bit of the fucking technique. So if I was just going to place some money on somebody's head in a fight between Adam Page and CM Punk, I'm not betting on the guy wearing butterflies on his crotch. He's lucky Punk didn't kick his ass in the back right after that segment. Seriously. Because Punk could have. Well, he could. He could he, here's the thing. There's not a lot of goddamn Gracie family members in AEW. There's a few of them there that have the credentials and have the fucking capability, and they're mostly fucking decent people. But all the goddamn assholes couldn't whip cream with an outboard motor and couldn't say suey if the hogs had them. So I think Punk's UFC fucking record would uh, trump the goddamn time they told the guy off at the indie show in, in Pomona or Reseda or wherever the fuck they're at. Anyway, let's get on to John Moxley. Oh, God, I can't believe I said those words. Punk goes on and turns his attention to the money match coming up at the pay-per-view, or at least so we thought still at this time. And this was fucking great. He said, ah, John Moxley, and they cheer. Yeah, he's number one in your heart, but not in this ring. Moxley is the third best guy in his own group, and that's a reoccurring theme in his career. Holy shit. They that you could have you could have fucking shaved a goddamn gorilla on the sharpness of these comments. He said Moxley says he breaks bones, but only one of us has broken a bone in the last few months, and that's me. It was mine, but still. I mean, because he's making fun of this fucking guy. This Dracula that drinks blood and breaks bones and grinds them to make his bread. The third best, and Eddie Kingston, I guess, just because of whatever, Eddie Kingston is the third best Eddie and the second best Kingston he's ever worked with. And he said that Moxley was not even the first John he was going to beat for a title in Chicago, talking about Cena. 
So after that onslaught, they play Moxley's music, and here come the plumber. And Punk actually says, I think I've got time before he gets here. I'll do some snow angels. And he lays down <laughs> in the ring and does snow angels in the ring, waiting for Moxley to do his fucking. How long is it going to be before tremendous. somebody? That was tremendous. somebody. Can somebody just give John Moxley a locker room inside the building? It's been years now. And then I mean, Brian, it, it was, it was honestly like you see an independent show where you have a star that's got his shit together and is recognized and people know who he is and he's coming to work with the local indie guy. And they're trying to work with each other, but one guy looks like a star that's together and composed and articulate, and the other guy looks like he's fucking trying to do a promo for smart fans and talk himself into it. And he did, Moxley did the spooky voice indie style stuff, and then Punk said, well, you you can be the heart and soul of AEW, I'll be the dollars and cents. <laughs> and just, God. Uh, and there was some more of the fighting spirit horse shit from Moxley. And he bows up at Punk, and Punk says, I'm afraid if I touch you, you'll just bleed all over me. God damn, I lost it. And then, of course, Moxley kisses Punk, and then they have the fight. And Jesus Christ, for a guy who literally likes to pummel people into jelly with his bare hands, according to him, Moxley can't throw a punch to save his life, can he? You know, his elbows in the matches we talked about, those have looked really bad, but he's in the middle of a brawl, and that was the thing that kind of took me out of the whole thing, was immediately, you know, okay, this part is, now they're working together, because his punches look so shitty. They look yeah. so bad. And conversely, when he gets hit with somebody, with a punch, he doesn't move his head at all, so everybody else's punches look like shit. And and then Punk also the way Moxley got in there and was throwing the back and forth Punk is it, they couldn't have a decent one two Punk's having to kind of lean over the top and throw him down at him I don't know but uh, the security hits and they pull him apart and they come back together and they pull him apart again and Moxley leaves and then he comes back but then he leaves again and that was so that wasn't a bad way to start out the show. And at least we know Punk is back, and now we've established, okay, now we know our main event for the pay-per-view for another three segments. Um, and at least they had some excitement. People were into it. Forgive me for not remembering. Was this the part, or was it later in the show when Claudio came out and manhandled Moxley like a little That's kid? the second time. Okay. That's the second. <laughs> he picked him up around the waist, and his feet were going wee, 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 wee off the ground. Um... But anyway, uh, closing thoughts on this segment, or have we gone too long already? I mean, it just depends on if you want to talk about any of the other things about the backstage stuff in AEW, or you want to save that for later, because... Well, let's save it for the individuals involved. They'll be back out. Um, Hobbs was in the back doing a promo, and son of a gun... Maybe somebody's, maybe it's Hobbs is listening. He threatened people. If you interrupt me this week, I'm going to fucking spine buster you. Because he was with Tony Schiavone and he got a chance to do the whole promo and nobody interrupted him. And he actually explained why he turned on Ricky Starks because Starks was okay with losing. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't the greatest reason. That's the reason they gave him. I'm not blaming him for that. But it was a good promo. He's, he needs to get a little more confident. Maybe have a little more conviction to him, but it was a good promo. But he's a heel and he's just talking about why he turned on Ricky Starks, and then he threatens QT and his guys, too, who are also heels and underneath heels. So is Hobbs a top guy that's a top heel that's fucking with Ricky Starks, who's getting a push as a baby face? Or is Hobbs an undercard fucking guy that's fucking with other undercard heels? Why is I don't, I don't know. It's... He wasn't given great material, and I don't like the idea of being involved with QT and that whole bunch, unless it's just a quick win, but it's a good start to actually hear Hobbs speak. What'd you think? I was happy to hear him speak, but I agree to your bigger point, which, and this is nothing personally against QT or any of the guys in his group, because, you know, it's them and there's other examples of it. When someone's got something going on, it feels like they always get dragged down a step because they get put in some at least two weeks, sometimes three week little feud with people we don't care about. 
before we get to see them do something we do care about. But and it's we're hard not for just them saying we we're, we're not just saying we, you and me don't care about. We're talking about we as in we the people. Yeah. Do not care. Nobody. Is there anybody on earth except their immediate family? that because of their presentation and their spot on the card and what they've done in the past cares about QT and his, and the boys. Solo, comodato, go-go. Nobody. It's just, uh. Well, we're about to pick up some time on this program. I, 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 I think Brian Danielson is one of the best in-ring wrestlers in the world. He was a tremendous world champion caliber heel about six months ago for about three weeks. He can work his ass off. He's got a great promo when he's motivated, but he's not Merlin, the fucking magician. 30 minutes, 30 minutes of Brian Danielson versus Daniel Garcia, two out of three falls on national cable television. Can you imagine if they gave that spot to a Ricky Starks? Can you imagine if they gave that spot to anybody with any fucking potential whatsoever in the next three to five years to sell a fucking ticket? Somebody with personality. Somebody with goddamn oomph to them. Somebody that doesn't look like another interchangeable white boy on an indie show doing wrestling holes. It's lost him over a hundred thousand viewers. I was going to ask you if you. I was going to ask you if you saw the quarter hour ratings. Somebody did send me a little bird. Sent me the information, and they started out with one million one hundred and four thousand viewers for Punk and Moxley, and they actually only dropped after that was over with for Brian and Garcia. They only dropped. Less than 100,000, about 90,000 to see Brian Danielson against Daniel Garcia. But by the time that the people realized that this thing was going for half an hour, the second quarter of that match dropped over another 100,000. And the only thing that brought them back was the next segment when we saw Mox and Punk again. They got the 100,000 back. But I, I'm I'm sure I I didn't watch this obviously, and Brian, you may tell me you had the patience, but I knew what it was going to be. It was going to be a fine wrestling match with Brian Danielson doing everything he could to make Daniel Garcia competitive and make him look like he can wrestle. And I'm sure he did a fine job of that. But he was also working competitively two out of three falls for half an hour with a guy that honest to God, folks, he didn't steal my dog. He hasn't shit on my front porch. I'm just telling you he's been over pushed and under fleshed out. They started using him from the start on every television show because somebody likes him, I guess, personally, he's got no charisma. He's got no gimmick. He's got no personality. He's got no promo. In five years, he might grow up enough to have one. But right now, zilch. And you're so what you're doing is you're pouring good talent in Brian Danielson or anybody else that tries to bring Daniel Garcia up to their level right now. You're pouring all that talent down a well and you're not getting anything back. Because I don't care how good his fucking matches are. It's the same thing as Yuta without a look and personality and charisma and some promo and some psychology and a concerted push, not just a goddamn hundred mile an hour. We're going to let him beat everybody in three weeks, but a long-term steady continual climb with certain stumbling blocks along the way. Daniel Garcia is going to be selling the same amount of tickets this this time next year as he is this year, which is none. So 30 minutes on national TV with one of the best wrestlers in the world winning two out of three by the skin of his teeth against an unknown indie guy who in his current incarnation is as exciting as a traffic uh, fucking cop. You know, he... he 
Why do they pick the people they pick to do the things they do with them? And then there's people that they get handed. Look at let Wardlow go out there and power bomb Brian Danielson in five minutes, one, two, three, and that'll get a motherfucker over. Send Daniel Garcia out for 30 minutes against Brian Danielson. Brian Danielson wins. That loses 100,000 viewers. What'd you think? You please the fans who want the work rate or whatever you want to call it, but you ignore the bigger picture. I agree with your overall thought that down the road, there may be something there with Yuta and Garcia. Right now, both look really young and both look really skinny. Um, you know, Yuta has the Moxley problem where his elbows, and when he tries to lay him in, they doesn't lay him in at all. But, you know, kind of makes me think of the Triple H discussion earlier. It makes me think of the Eric Watts push. The big difference is they have fans there who will accept what they're trying to do. So they are cheering Yuta. They, I don't know, let's say they cheer Garcia and he's done the worst promos ever. But they'll watch Garcia and try to get into his work rate. But I think to the bigger picture, these guys are being stuffed down people's throats on TV. And I don't think it's what people want right now. Maybe down the road. Maybe when they fill out a little bit. Maybe, like you said, develop them a little bit. We saw Daniel Garcia just popped up on TV. And then he was in six-man matches with 2.0. And then they were part of the Jericho thing. And now all of a sudden he's beating Brian Danielson. And then Yuta just showed up on TV. Moxley and them decided they wanted to do something with him. So they just did it without thinking if it's the time or the place or the right way to do it. Or the person. And now we're stuck with these guys. Meanwhile, we're celebrating powerhouse Hobbs getting to speak. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like when you say there are other guys out there, Ricky Starks. I don't like that they turned him babyface, but now I just want to see him used well. There are guys there. He wasn't even there. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Apparently, from what I heard, there were a lot of people there who weren't used, which is a whole nother story. Apparently, there's a whole lot of people flying into these shows and staying at very cozy hotels. Hey, at least at least Tony Khan, he bought Ring of Honor, and now they're really going to be happy because last time I was with Ring of Honor and we, we ran Charleston, West Virginia, we were allowed six plane tickets for the whole card and they wanted everybody to double up at the Hampton Inn. Now, Tony's, Tony's an international goddamn travel agent flying people all over the world to come watch a show and stay at the fucking Hemsley Palace. You bring a Ring of Honor, and this isn't meant as an insult, but Garcia and Yuta feel to me like classic Ring of Honor wrestlers. Yeah. Not guys you would see on national TV getting the push right out of the gate. Young guys that you could bring along, because that's where Kyle O'Reilly and Adam Cole were at one point in Ring of Honor, and they were young, and we used them in the middle underneath where they could get some experience, and they grew up and came along. And then, of course, Adam shrank and went along. But, um... But the, the, you don't, nor Garcia would not be main event guys in Ring of Honor because of the, the again, not in my Ring of Honor at least because personality and ability to the experience to go out and be a television fucking performer instead of just going out and doing indie style wrestling matches. That's not saying they'll never get it, but they ain't got it now. And this, what this is going to do is besides the fact it's going to just make people sick and fed up with them because goddamn give me a break also it's going to give them the impression that they are already main event guys and they don't need like the other dipshit hangnail he's already a main event guy he doesn't need any work doesn't need any help doesn't need any advice they keep pushing him like this and patting him and making over him say oh yeah you're doing great well they are doing great with what they're being given it's not their fault that the creative is fucking caca but, you know, I don't expect them to say, don't push me, I don't deserve it. But they shouldn't be pushed because right now they don't deserve it. Hey, on the topic of Danielson, you know, I get that he's going to do what he wants to do. And we all have to remember that. But, and this is where, you know, someone needs to talk to him about maybe stuff or you do something else. I'm not going to rehash the blown opportunity with him. I'm just going to ask you the question. Does he mean as much today? in AEW, as he did a year ago when he came in. Oh, good God, no. Because now he's there. 
Because punk and, still means a lot. Like punk didn't lose that. You yeah. know, like Moxley well, means as much today as he did when he came in. Danielson means less today. Punk is not going to just allow himself to be put in a group with some of his friends so that the his star power can be spread to them rather than the other way around. And Punk is not going to go out there and get juice for a fucking guy and go 30 minutes with a fucking guy that nobody could recognize if he walked down the fucking street tomorrow. And he's not, Danielson is too nice and is not cognizant enough of his status in the wrestling business and what he could do business-wise for this company if he wasn't so nice and trying to play with everybody equally. But that's just me. But we've lost we've lost 200,000 viewers after that match from the start of the show. Well, how do we get some of them back? Tony Nese and Mark Sterling walking down the entrance ramp and I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is going to be horrible. And then Moxley wipes him out. And he gets the microphone, and he challenges Punk for the unification match right now. And here comes Punk. And they have another fight and pull apart and blah, 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 and chaos going on and everything. And that, apparently, just people seeing what was going on got him back up over a million viewers for that quarter hour, even though this was not 15 minutes worth. And they came back briefly and then left because they didn't get any more Punk and Moxley. And I'll tell you something. Here's another reason why they lost some viewers. Next, the top of the hour, 9 o'clock Eastern. And Brett, we've talked enough about the top of the hour that everybody knows why the top of the hour is significant. That's why that's when people are changing uh changing channels, finding something else to watch on TV. Vince McMahon would fucking take a stick to you and beat you over the head with it if you had anything less than major firepower going to the ring at the top of an hour and to a lesser extent at the bottom of an hour, if you could time it right, because people switch from 30 minute programs. But at the top of this hour, they've had Paige out there. They've had Punk out there. They've had Danielson out there. <laughs> the top of the hour is the varsity blondes against the gun club coming to the ring. And I wrote top of the hour, this match, what the fuck? And I'm not saying they shouldn't have done it, but here, and as soon as they ring the bell, and it's over. The guns gave Griff Garrison, pushed Pillman off the apron of the ring, gave Griff three bumps and a finish, one, two, three. I assume because either the Moxley Punk promo or the Danielson match or both went drastically long and they had to cut time, but thanks for coming, Varsity Blondes, Jesus Christ. And then here comes Billy Gunn in and does a promo and is praising his boys, and that's what I wanted to see out of you guys. And then old Stokely comes out on the entranceway, and Billy looks at him, and the Gunn boys jump their father and beat the shit out of him. And then the acclaimed run down and save Billy, and the heels run off, and they scissor daddy. So now we are expected to believe that even though I'm sure people around their neighborhood will see them riding down the road together all the time, uh, Billy and his sons don't like each other anymore. That's that's where we're at right now, right? They're going to believe that one, aren't they? Like a brother versus brother, a father versus son thing always works. Do you have a problem inherently with father versus son or just the way this was done, just to be clear? Well, I mean, it, it, this was done like shit because it just... You know, I, I, the match was just to get them out there, and then they did the angle, which they've been teasing somewhat, and anybody could see coming, but you can't believe that the kids are going to be beating up the father just like brothers never want to do angles. And it's just too hard to make people... Well, now they don't care about people believing it. But before, guys would stay away from doing angles with their brothers because it was hard to make people believe it. And if Dory and Terry, the only way they ever had one match, the one match in Japan was it was the finals of a tournament. It had to be that way. 
but it, most brother angles do not do not work and this is I don't remember a father and son angle, do you? Where they were against each other? If there was a father son thing it probably would have been in Memphis just cuz they had more fathers and sons after a while yeah. than any other place. I just I would have liked to have seen uh, the guns are fucking fantastic. The kids, I would have liked to have seen them with Billy because you know, then that makes sense. Because they still need maybe a little mouthpiece or a little somebody in the corner, but whatever. Nevertheless. How about the pop the, of, how about the pop oh, the acclaimed got? Oh, they love them. Of course, now how long has it been since we've heard him rap? I just said it on the other show how funny it was. Ever since you brought up how much you liked his rapping, he hasn't rapped and it happened again. And the 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 last time he rapped, I was so mad because it was a dumpster match that I didn't bother to write it down and then they haven't done it again. But Speaking of mouthpieces and people that need one, Jungle Boy wandered out to the ring, and apparently he was wearing a shirt that said somebody is a pussy a few weeks ago because he said he was asked to never wear the t-shirt again, but it hit the nail on the head. And then he started to say to, well, it was Christian, that Christian was a pussy later on and he got interrupted, but I mean... <sighs> Does Jungle Boy have it? Is it going to come out? If it, if it was, would it have come out by now? Verbally, speaking on television, having any kind of passion or emotion? Are all people of his age bracket this boring no, and no, no, bland no, and blasé no. these days? No, Is that a thing it's now? Him. It's him. It's not everyone in his age bracket. There are people who could tell a story, talk, or, or entertaining in general. I think, in terms of on the mic... He has shown no skills whatsoever as a babyface. I think the only hope you have is actually if he was a heel. He's shown himself to be able to be snotty on the mic, to be heelish on the mic. But as a babyface, he didn't even raise his voice. He was just out there talking. And I was like, where's this going? This is terrible. And it went on way too long. And he shouldn't be out there doing promos. And everyone should know that by now. I don't see how the fuck he could be a heel unless he had... it. Unless the dinosaur was a heel and his partner, that may be something, because then you'd have a little prick instigating shit. But could Jungle Boy instigate anything, you think? Could he really get in under anybody's skin? Jungle Boy is a chicken shit heel with Luchasaurus as his muscle? If, could he do it? Could he pull that off? Could he the, emote as a chicken shit? That's Yes. I can't say if he could or couldn't. That's very Well, anyway... Question. He uh he started talking about Christian Cage and people started whatting him because they weren't listening to him. But then here came Christian, and it was the way he was talking. Well, yeah, it just it, 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 there's no passion there. There's no conviction, whatever. But when Christian came out, immediately people stopped whatting, and uh, Jungle Boy challenged him for all out, and Christian comes out and declines the challenge <laughs> and wants to. Fix things. He's great. Christian is doing his best promo work. He wanted to fix things. He wanted to make it up to Jungle Boy. He said, I love you. And the crowd's chanting, bullshit, bullshit. But they didn't what Cage because he's got delivery and material. And they wanted to listen to it. And he commands the room verbally. But anyway, when he said, I love you and let's have a hug, then Jungle Boy double legged him and tackled him and threw about 47 fake punches at him, and Christian cut him off for a second, but Jungle Boy came back and stomped Christian's arm in the stairs and then bashed his head into the steel stairs over and over and did all of that without still looking like he wanted to hurt anybody. They were going through the motions. Christian was selling his ass off, but Jungle Boy don't go crazy. Jungle Boy just gets mildly perturbed. Um, why did they stomp Christian's arm? Is he going to be injured? Is he out? Why did the, the baby face beat up the heel in this fashion before the match is announced? I, I'm not sure I know what's going on. We'll find that he can't wrestle and he has Luchasaurus's contract. And Luchasaurus has to wrestle in his stead. <sighs> eh, the only thing wrong with that is then we can't see Christian Cage wrestle. <laughs> we got to watch the other two. Uh, speaking about watching the other two, did you love the incredible amount of television time that Wardlow and FTR got this week? 
My God, you know, Daniel Garcia, he only gets 30 minutes. But Wardlow, the biggest homegrown star they've got, and FTR, the most over tag team in wrestling now, got a backstage promo for 45 seconds about a six-man tag with Jay Lethal, Sanjay Dutt, and Zippy the Giant Pinhead. So we get this. Instead of FTR Bucks 3, because the Hardly Boys are jealous and refuse to put FTR over in the big one. No, I think this is booking 2.0, next generation booking, next level booking. How do you capitalize on the buzz of a tag team that had a groundswell of support that the fans finally, on their own, lifted up and would carry out of the arena? What do you do? You keep them off TV, and when you do show them on TV, give them 90 seconds. And they're going to be in a six-man tag with a guy that they had to admit on their interview that they nobody understands why that they're standing alongside Wardlow and they're wrestling one of the top talents in the business and his manager and fucking giant cohort that can't stick his thumb in his ass on the first try. Is that next week or is that Friday? I I, I don't remember. Because if it's know. Friday, no one's going to see it. Friday, nobody's going to see it anyway. Yeah. So that's, you got that going for you. Uh, and now, you know, a lot of people uh, doubted us when we say the reason why this match was changed was because the Hardleys are jealous of FTR and they don't want to put them over and do business the right way. And they want to play with their friends and they want to bring their trampoline cowboys in to so they can have their kind of matches and, and they can have some belts. So they... They gave a team that nobody believes is the best team in the company the t world tag team title so that they couldn't be accused of not wanting to do a job. They just wouldn't do it to FTR. And then they bring another one of their buddies back so they can all play together and have the six-man belts. And it's funny how these things work out exactly how we predict they're going to, Brian. I actually don't think there's anyone who has the track record that this show has in terms of saying things that are going to happen in AEW before they happen and saying things behind the scenes that are going to happen before they happen. Well, now, sometimes we only say it like a year ahead of time. Like, it, was, it wasn't it was more than a year ahead of time that you're the one that said that Cody Rhodes would be the first executive vice president that would leave because he'd have problems coexisting with the other numbskulls and have a brighter future. Well, beyond even just Cody, we talked about general problems backstage amongst the executive vice presidents, the story that a lot of people ignored until they didn't. But we talked about it before anyone. Well, and we mentioned uh, that also that the Hardly Boys would probably be bringing back douchebag number one. If if James Brown could be soul num brother number one, then I think that old Harpo can be douchebag number one. So the six-man tournament begins with Andre Oliolio and Roosh and Dragon Lee against the Hardly Boys and their mystery partner. And it was obviously not a mystery. We called it about six weeks ago what was going to happen. Why do people keep doubting us? Because we say a lot of things with laughter. We say a lot of things in a joking fashion. You say things bad about wrestlers that people love, and that's, of course, a mortal sin. So because of that, when we say shit, it's, Oh, what does he know? He's on the Jim Cornette show. Or what does he know? He's irrelevant. And then it's like, oh shit, they were right again. Almost like they know what they're talking about. Well, in this one, help me figure this one out. Now, Andre is a heel. And Dragon Lee hadn't been around till now. And Rush was here once. But the Hardly Boys, they just switched babyface because... Well, their feelings got hurt by their other friends not wanting to team with them, so they had to go get their original friend, who they bring out, obviously, Kenny Olivier, the greatest wrestling artist in the world. But when, when Olivier left last, he was a heel. And he had a heel manager, Don Fallis. And he had a heel hanger on, Michael, knock it, knock it, knock it to fuck off and get off my television. So now... They've brought Kenny back, Kenny back to team with them now that they're baby faces against these other heels. But the thing that happened that never happened was that not only did Kenny never turn baby face, 
but Fallis came out with him. Even if Kenny is a babyface now by virtue of the fact that he is coming to the aid of his friends, the Cucamonga kids who just switched babyface because they got their feelings hurt that their other friends wouldn't team with them anymore. Why is Don Fallis necessary? He's a heel manager to a heel champion. Remember what they were trying to go for was the modern day version of Bockwinkle and Heenan, although boy, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, talk really. about when you, <laughs> when you order something from Neiman Marcus versus from fucking great value or whatever. But now Don Fallis comes back and the babyface partner of the new baby faces has a heel manager that nobody likes and has never tried to be a nice guy. So why did the heel manager have to come back with, with, uh, does this make sense? None of the heel baby face stuff here makes any sense. Here's a bigger question. How many weeks ago were the Bucks turned on? Was it two weeks ago? Two, we, three, whatever. Have we seen Adam Cole and those guys since then? Have no. they done a promo following up on it? Have we heard a peep about any of that? I don't think so. Well, let's just talk about this match because that won't take long. And then we'll get to the aftermath of the whole thing. Um, Andre Rush and Dragon Lee, Hardly Boys, and Kenny Olivier. So 30 seconds in, they're the flying Willendas. And Rick Knox is the referee, so nothing's going to, no rules are going to be, uh, uh, you know, held to, and they're going to do anything they want. They're in and out. Why was Twinkle Toes wearing a superhero costume shirt with fake muscles built in? They called it a compression shirt. But it actually had, like the old in the old days when George Reeves was Superman, they put foam rubber in for his bigger chest, shoulders, and arms. There was goddamn built-in muscles in his shirt. Was that a regulation therapeutic shirt? I'm not Brian, sure. I'm not sure what it was. I'm not sure if he has Sabu scars he's trying to cover up. But maybe this is part of his gimmick we never understood before. The way he moves in the ring, the way he shakes. He's a guy who's been thrown into cold water. Now he's got a wetsuit. <laughs> So at one point, at a... But let me stop you there, because... Okay, go ahead. For anyone who didn't see this, we've seen, like, Ric Flair wrestle with a shirt in the past. We've seen different people wrestle a with shirts. shirt But with Omega, even though it was a compression shirt, something that's supposed to be worn by athletes, it felt weird seeing him wearing... Because it didn't feel like something a wrestler would wear. It almost looked like he had gear on top of gear on top of gear. It, it, was, it was strange. It would, it would look like he was padding his physique there a little bit. But hey, that's better than stuff in your crotch, right? Make your chest, your arms look a little bigger. Nothing to matter with that. It's the real heats when you stuff your crotch. Uh, did you see him try the... He's rusty. It's been 200 and some days since he wrestled. He tried his fireman's carry flip over thing and fell on his ass and just sat there and laughed at his boys and sold it. Um, so he sold something. At, at, at one point, two guys tagged, t tagged in at the same time in front of the referee, and then they did a triple team. And as usual with these guys' matches, it got old less than 10 minutes in because everybody's in and out, back and forth, doing moves. Nothing flows. Nothing makes sense. The referee's useless. The Andre Oleolio's team is sloppy as shit on their, I, I have to use quotation marks, basics for that and it just and then finally they built up uh, they kept twinkle toes in and out where he didn't have to do too much but they gave him a hot tag and this comeback was just the most ridiculous gesticulating exaggerating thing and he's stancing and doing the poses and the pointing and then all three, all three of the baby faces, quote unquote, tagged in at the same time. And the referee allowed that. And they did a prolonged six way where nobody could keep track of what was happening. And then everybody did dives except Twinkle Toes. But then they kept foiling his dive attempts. Maybe he didn't want to do a dive and take a chance on that. Say, well, we'll just have the heels foil it. And he at one point sold his knee in a very phony, overly dramatic and stagey way. And then came the big spot of the match. Since Kenny can't dive, they'll bring the dive to Kenny. <laughs> and they, they go out on the floor and they take the security railing in front of the front row and they pull it closer to the ring by about, what, two feet. 
and they sit Kenny up on the railing. I don't know where his partners in crime were at this point to prevent this because all three of the heels are on him. And then Dragon Lee, the one with the mask on the other team, he does the dive. And they both go over the rail into the crowd and smack a little girl in the front row right in the fucking face. And then the camera shoots both the wrestlers laying there, but they won't widen out to shoot the, <laughs> the girl selling and people standing up and trying to get out of the way of these goddamn uninvited dinner guests that have just dropped in to their laps. And there was the, it was almost like, let's do Cornette's spot, the spot that he calls every week when we do shit like this. We'll go too far. We'll go over the rail. We'll hit a little kid in the face. We'll get sued. Tony's out of business. And we're all on the fucking soup line. And by gum, yes, since they were in Charleston, West Virginia, to answer everybody's question they're asking mentally, the little girl did get Stephen P. News business card. <sighs> what? what you, and they had to completely ignore the fact that's what that it is. They're standing in front of children four feet behind them with this fucking goofy idiot diving head first out of the ring over the top rope coming a hundred miles an hour. And they're in front of women and children. Thankfully this crew wasn't on the Titanic. Elsewise, all the kids and the fucking women would have been swimming and sleeping with the fishes and the sharks. What a stupid and unnecessary idea this spot was. And anyone watching at home, as soon as they started doing it, if anyone listens to this show that was watching that, as soon as you saw them going for it, you said, oh my God, there's a kid right behind the dead center. I hope they don't do something near the kid. And what do you know? They wiped the kid out. Whap! Down to the ground. Down goes the kid. Uh, more goofy bumps in this match. And then after all this chaotic stuff that they've done and all these wild moves... They're not smart enough. They don't know how to build up to an exciting finish. So when they finish doing all the moves that they can do, then old Kenny hits two of those Canterbury knee lifts, the little skippy thing, the little the V trigger from his video game, and then barely gets the guy up for the one wing fairy, one, two, three, and a, the flattest finish. After they do all that stuff, instead of building up to a Slam bang finish, as Tootsmont would say. They just grab one of the heels and beat him flat. Just that's it. Ah, after all that chaos. So that was the match that lost them 200,000 viewers. And then, as the baby faces, allegedly, the Cucamonga kids and Harpo get out of the ring. There's 15 seconds left on the air, and the other two, Rush and Andre, turn on their partner and pull his mask off. Why? And why did they do it literally seven seconds before they went off the air? I was going to say, don't say 15 seconds. It was a lot quicker than that. Well, that's when they started looking at him with evil intent. What, what was that? Who's on whose side here? And why it, it, did, did they either have the time to do the angle or don't do the fucking angle? And why are we doing the angle when the guy didn't, he got beat, but he didn't fucking fuck up his partners. He just got beat in a flat, unconvincing fashion. So they got to rip his mask off and turn on him. I thought one of them was the other one's brother. Uh, yeah, one of them is the other one's brother. So they got, now they got the, the, the sons turning on the father <laughs> and the brother against brother. My God, it's, it's, it's chaos here. It's a civil war family against family. You get a good mutter against a fodder. They don't do angles with the wrestlers that the fans want them to do stuff with. They do angles with the wrestlers that the other wrestlers like. Huh? 
Well, so that was that main event, and that's what was on television, hey. and that's what cost them 200,000 views, but there was more in the building. What? What were you saying, hey? Was, well, you know, you actually just kind of led me to that in the building. I thought one of the interesting reactions, we're watching this show the whole night, Punk got a major reaction. I mean, everything you said, they were sitting on every word. They didn't want him like they did Jungle Boy. Moxley, whatever you want to say about him, big reaction from those fans. They were into him. I heard from people in the building, they said one of the biggest reactions... Claudio. They said the place went nuts for Claudio. Yes. On that second pull apart, Claudio came out and that's when he picked picked Moxley up and handled him like a small child. I guess he wrestled for one of their other shows also while he was there and he got a big reaction. But, you know, the Bucks got an okay pop. Nothing special. Nothing like they used to. Omega got a big pop for coming out. Big surprise pop. And then what happened? It wore off quickly. During that match, there were the little bursts of this is awesome when things weren't really that awesome. And then dead silence. Dead silence. They were begging people to cheer for them. The Bucks would yell, come on! Come on! And Omega, you know, let me hear you while I'm punching this guy. Yeah, he got up one time and like, come on, let me hear you. I can't hear you because they're not making any noise. Um, Part of it was the match. It, and it, again, it's West Virginia. They expect to see something that makes sense. It's Crockett Promotions territory back in the old days. It's a little more WCW. It's a little more down south. They expect this shit to actually be good and halfway violent looking instead of phony and illogical. And then the other thing is, okay, they got the pop. Kenny's back. And then Kenny doesn't go out and do any of the Kenny stuff that Kenny does that impresses everybody because he's obviously still fucked up and you know maybe he ought to take another six months off i'll wait it's fine hey, and those ratings but, tell a story and they're well and they're not the hot they're not the hot individuals anymore That's right. the hot individuals are the people that the fans have started to take to on their own rather than the people that when the show went on the air the fans were told these are your main event stars and you're supposed to cheer for them. Now people are deciding for themselves, and they like the people. Its work looks good, and it makes sense. And they're not insufferable douchebags as personalities. Smarmy, smug, self-absorbed little fucking vanilla midgets. So that's why... The, so between the match not making any sense and being the same shit they always do... The heels are not necessarily a group of heels that people want to see, you know, lynched and hung up and strung out and run over with cars and anything bad happened to. They're just there. And then old Twinkle Toes comes back to this ridiculous, over-exaggerated introduction and, and they do very little of anything and people were, and they made it last 20, 25 minutes. So for all those reasons, people didn't give a shit. They thought people were going to react like they react to CM Punk for Kenny returning, and they didn't. They just didn't. I think, you know what thought did, don't you, as Mama Cornette used to say? No. He thought he farted, but he didn't. When you when you think like that, your pants fill up with shit. <laughs> does, <laughs> does, any, <laughs> does anyone actually That's... look forward to the six-man division now? The trios division after this match? That turned I wasn't off so many viewers. To it before this match. This wasn't good. I mean, that's the other thing. People were trying to say, like, oh, it was nice to have Kenny back. They're leaving out the part beyond you and me talking about it, and we all know what you think of this. It was a really not good match. Really not good. And people were kind of sick of seeing a lot of the Buck stuff, but I don't know. Again, the ratings tell a story here. All right, but I wasn't in the building. But I've heard tell that after the cameras quit rolling, as they say, that old Twinkle Toes, he was the one who decided to take the microphone and leave the fans to go home happy with some kind of profound rah-rah statement. Is this correct? That's true, Jim. I don't know if this was the end of the night or just right after the dynamite taping, but there is footage, uh, there's fan footage, there's official footage, all sorts of things out there of Omega and the Bucks and Phallus and uh, I think Nakazawa too, maybe, in their cutler in the ring afterwards for a celebratory speech, I guess. Celebratory or masturbatory? I think a little bit of both. And of course, this is a big night because CM Punk started the night, at least on Dynamite, with a speech that everyone's still talking about today. A speech, a promo that everyone's still talking about today. 
I heard from people in the building that said Kenny Omega just gave a rambling speech. We're not exactly sure what he was trying to get across, but he ended it by calling us cat shit. <laughs> so let's play it in a few well, parts. I, I was about to say, if there, if there was only some way that we could hear the words of the world's greatest wrestling artist to determine why he likened his fans to cat shit and why that everybody left the building saying that this guy is on the verge of a nervous mental breakdown. If only there was some way we could hear those words that came out of his mouth. Well, let's go to that. We'll break this up a few times <laughs> to discuss some of the words coming out of this man who appears to be cracking his mouth. Here it is. Kenny Omega in Charleston, West Virginia. story short, it's always a pleasure to be performing in front of you fellows. Oh, good God. And I thought, hey, with a, main, main, with a rare main event slot tonight, I might as well take the microphone and say a couple words to you guys because I've been gone for quite some time. And if I do it in this format, I don't have to worry about how much time I take. I don't have to worry about how tired or hurt I am. I can just speak to you guys like a normal human being. Because really, then please that's start. All I am. So for the past seven, eight, nine months, or whatever it's been, it's been pretty grueling. Many times I questioned myself, am I really gonna be able to come back to AEW and perform at the level of these professional wrestlers? And certainly, it's gonna take me a while to catch up to these guys. It might be a while before I'm able to challenge for a singles title again. But this very much is a work in progress, and I'm very glad that all of you are joining me on this journey. Well, let's stop oh, it there God. for the first yeah, part. Let's stop it there for a second. First of all, I. I know the, the breathy phone sex voice, he is amplified after he's had a match because he's a little bit blown up. And the the sing-song delivery uh, is something that he does on occasion, and it, it gives him a bigger element of douchebaggery when he has that lilting cadence to his voice. But did somebody kick him in the nuts? Because it sounds like his voice has gone up two or three. Did he have a... Um, some type of hernia. Uh, it was a hernia. On his vocal cords. And, oh, it was a hernia. It was a hernia, not the vocal so cords. He, he, so he's up here like this because he doesn't want to strain himself too much. I've had a couple of those. I know they can be rough, so I don't blame him for sounding like fucking Tinkerbell. Go ahead. Don't get it confused, however. I'm not a good guy. I might even cheat to win every now and then. But one thing that I will say is when we're in this ring, you're getting a genuine Young Bucks, Katie Omega, and Elite performance from the genuine Young Bucks and Kenny Omega. <laughs> we're not pretending to be somebody that we're not. We're not a tribute act. We're not a parody. We're not selfish, and we're not in this for selfish <laughs> means and for self <laughs> selfish gains. We are here to leave a legacy. And that legacy isn't titles. It's not even match ratings. It's not even how much money we make for our families and ourselves. It is changing the world via changing wrestling world and the way that you guys consume it. Oh, good God. He's an insufferable cunt, isn't he? He's going to change he the way you consume wrestling. He's going to change the way that I fucking throw up after dinner. Is it, eh. How's he going to change the way I consume it? Instead of watching it, am I going to eat it? Yeah, but maybe he's going to send it to you by mental telepathy. They, these twats are convinced that they are hugely important, vastly more important than they, they actually are. And you can, but the douchebaggery drips from them every time you hear them speak. And who are they trying to identify with here? Other douchebags with sing-song voices? Who is he calling out there? We're not fake. We're not phony. Well, We're they, they, real. They said they're, they're not a tribute act because, oh, guys like 
I don't know, Punk and FTR, they do Bret Hart moves because they do moves that real professional wrestlers did, not moves that they saw right. in the matinee version of Cirque de Bolshoi at in Vegas. They're not tribute acts. They're not doing DX hand signs in a fake NWO. That's not them. <laughs> not a tribute act. Not the elite. Don't call the Bullet Club a tribute act. But now they did say we're not a parody. Oh, believe me. You're a parody of a human <laughs> fucking being. You fucking curly haired twat. You're a parody. All right. Everything you people do is a parody in wrestling. Where do we get to the cat shit? All right, let me get back to this from, what do we call him? A weeb or a weeboo? What, what was it? A weeble? A, we a weeb, a weebo. A weeb. Here's the weebo himself, Kenny Omega. So maybe, heck, you don't like six-man hey. tags. That's fine, because we're going to give you guys the greatest singles matches. We're going to give you guys the greatest hardcore matches, mixed matches, women's matches, all different kinds of matches. It's going to be a smorgasbord of wrestling. That was always the mission statement. And as long as the... Let me just stop it real quick, because what he said, because we cut it before, the legacy they want to leave is not the money they leave to their family or anything else. It's changing the world through changing the wrestling world, through changing the way people consume wrestling by giving them a smorgasbord of wrestling which would be, I guess, their idea of what AEW has been up to this point. Which is a mess. That's the whole problem. The fucking marks that Tony Khan signed to be his brain trust at first thought that it would be good if they have every single kind of fucking wrestling in the world on the same show. And it's been caca. Because that doesn't work. Because it doesn't make any sense. Because you run off more people than you fucking attract because people who want to see legitimate, serious, competitive wrestling don't want to see the fucking silly shit and the girly men and the falderall and the fucking hurt feelings amongst the snowflake crowd. And the, the, the blood and the barbed wire and the broken glass and the bullshit negates the great athletic performances of the really talented workers. So then you've run their fans off and, you know, the garbage match people will watch anything as long as they get to see their garbage. So they'll watch the show just to see somebody get sliced up and cut and bleed from asshole to appetite. But the smorgasbord is the worst idea that anybody ever had in wrestling because that's like having an action, adventure, comedy, drama, parody, period, piece, historical documentary with big bands. Let's hear more from Ty. And as long as the elite are here, you will make sure we will make sure that you guys get that variety every time we perform. Win, lose, or draw. You're going to get our greatest effort. Win, lose, or draw. Taping, athletic tape, medical devices or not, you're going to get Kenny Omega too. Somehow. Somehow by a stroke of luck, and because these guys are better than you even know that they are, they're incredible. We were able to survive tonight. <laughs> we're alive in this tournament. It's not all of a sudden start cheering us. You guys booed us for like a year. Well, now they're going into shtick, obviously. I'm yeah. trying to get to Well, the... and also, you know, he said we survived it, but think of the fucking poor viewers. Oh, the humanity. Yeah, they didn't survive. They tuned out. They didn't survive. They tuned out. They went, they jumped out a window somewhere. The Real Housewives of Chattanooga were on. But let's uh, <laughs> let's get a little bit more at the end of uh, Kenny Omega here. To please, maybe I should be mad too because the reason why I'm in this state right now, the reason why I have to have three, sometimes four sessions of physical rehab every single day, is because of you. Maybe I should hate each and every one of you because I come back out here for you guys. It's never for me. Oh boy. It's never for me. Work so for what free. I'm going to do right now is I'm going to be a little strange. I don't get up <laughs> much, so I, be I became a strange individual. I'm going to liken you fans 
to a very mischievous cat that pees and poops all over the house. Boy, do I get mad when I find it. Boy, do I get mad because I have to clean it. But heck, how can I hate a little kitty cat? Oh, fuck. And there's the line of him. How, how can he hate a little pussy? And he's got two of them standing right next to him. <laughs> Every time I hear this fucking guy speak, I realize that there's no way in any world in any universe currently existing or yet to be determined where I could have stood to sit down and talk to him for three minutes. But he's, uh, you, you get Kenny with medical device. I'd like to get Kenny with a medical device. Maybe a fucking scalpel. Maybe a goddamn thing they give the colonoscopies with. Uh, it, the, so he's melting down, right, mentally, because they can't take the pressure of the fans not buying their repetitive, phony gymnastic performances instead of gravitating toward the rougher, more accomplished, more realistic, possibly more violent, definitely more manly uh, fucking talent that they're preferring now. No, they're all very upset because in their eyes, they still think AEW is them, not realizing AEW is Tony Khan's and his dad's. They yeah. own it. They took you guys, they signed you guys, they paid you guys handsomely, they let you guys pretend to be executives, even though no way in the world are you guys in any way executives. They let them pretend to be wrestlers for quite some time. And the company has now seen what happens when real stars like CM Punk get there. And I understand why a lot of these guys resent CM Punk. He exposed them. He exposed them by just being there. By just being, he pointed out that they aren't as big as stars as they think they are. How much of this speech do you think is directed at CM Punk? Probably the majority of it, because again, and we, how long have we been saying this? I think we said this at the start. You know, there's going to be a time where the few serious talents in the wrestling business that are in that company get fed the fuck up with the silliness and the falderall and the fake shit and the we're all petite friends, you know, doing our thing business. And there's going to be a civil war and. The lines are being drawn. You want to get over, you want to be a star, you want to make money, you want to be serious about your business, or you want to play with your buddies and act like you're a big deal because you can't tell that people don't like the smell of your particular farts. I think you heard from a lot of people, both directly and things that would get out to you know wrestling media, early on especially, oh, this is the best place I've ever worked in, this is the best locker room I've ever been in, Tony's the best boss I've ever had, I've heard from numerous people. But look at where we are now. You know, there's a difference between wanting to work somewhere where you could just do anything you want and you love your boss because they'll let you do anything you want and actually working someplace where there's a goal to get from A to Z so that it benefits the company and everyone involved. And it appears that the, whatever you want to call them, Camp Cucamonga. Camp Cucamonga. They like to do things their way, and if they don't get things their way, they have hissy fits, they have breakdowns, they whine. You start seeing things appear in certain wrestling media outlets with their side of things getting out there. But the fact that right now things are ending up in, in the Observer saying that some executives, and, or shouldn't say executives, some people are at their wits' end with everything happening, that tells you the story. Some well, now, and, and Uncle Dave... Uncle Dave also, let's not forget about this. He actually said, well, the big thing that started all this is Colt Cabana. Colt Cabana. Yeah. Colt Cabana is out of the dork order. There was no angle and they just stopped bringing him to TV. That's what started all this. You mean to tell me that these guys are supposed to be vice presidents of a national cable television promotion? And they're supposed to be big stars in the case of Page, even though he's not a vice president. They didn't get him a, a, a position. They just got him a job. It's over Cole Cabana? I can understand if, 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 if CM Punk had come in and suddenly they had fired or diminished or sent to the side Brian Danielson, or even Jericho, he's got name value, or some major Even Jungle star. Boy. Even Jungle Boy, because they liked him because he got cute hair. That would have been one thing, but a fucking guy who was completely and utterly useless in every way to begin with long before 
that his former friend came to the company? Do you remember a Colt Cabana match? Do you remember a great Colt Cabana pro or any Colt Cabana promo? Do you remember Colt Cabana doing anything other in this company than wrestling on fucking YouTube and standing in the middle of a group of job guys to be the most experienced job guy in that group? He wasn't pushed. He wasn't even prodded. And he meant nothing to the show, the revenue, nothing. And then, like some of the other people that fit that category, they just stopped using him. We can think of Dwarf Dong Sucker. We can think of Jelly. We can think, I mean, Tony doesn't have the balls to fire anybody, but he'll ghost him in a heartbeat. So everybody that doesn't want real stars to give them real competition in the company was like, oh, poor Coke Cabana. What could have happened? Maybe it's the guy that he turned on and and that he fucking caused all those problems to punk. Maybe that's it. Well, we'll get even. We'll we'll just treat punk bad. Cause he's not in our clique, our little group. Fuck. It's a job guy that got sent home because he wasn't contributing anyway. I doubt seriously if Punk had anything to do with it, if he had to talk very hard. There was no upside to having this guy on the roster, just like they've got another 30 people on the roster there's no upside to having. Most people don't even know they're there. So, again, these little kids can play big-time wrestling all they want, but goddamn, and you know, here's another thing, Punk and Danielson and FTR and some of these other guys, I doubt very seriously if you're going to hurt their fucking feelings with criticism or a mean promo or somebody saying something bad about because they've worked for the big time. They've been to the WWE. They've been to the evil empire. Those people are professional feeling herders. They'll fuck with you to the bone. So th those guys are not going to be intimidated or have their feelings hurt or get their panties in a wad because the Cucamonga kids and their band of merry misfits from the Lollipop Guild say mean things about them. Yeah, I have a feeling, well, except for da Danielson's too nice, but the rest of them, Cash, Dax, and Punk, probably just soon punch one of those fucks in the face as look at them anyway. So they probably don't say a lot uh, in person to to uh, bring that along any. And again, the way it's being reported, the way it's now being put in print, I mean, Dave Meltzer basically said it's all because of Cabana. No one's saying it's because of Punk publicly. They're saying Cabana was not used, and all of a sudden everyone's blaming Punk, it seems like. Yeah. I mean, if Adam Page on live TV, decided to do that against, again, the biggest star in the company, all because of Colt Cabana, he should have been suspended and sent home without pay because that's bullshit. That's I minor league gone, shit. I would have gone straight to the firing, but I get, I get your point. You yes, get the belt and, off, and hmm? again, well, yeah, you got to hit the belt. Well, it's your fault for putting a belt on a fucking irresponsible little jack off like Sorry. that. But um, I'm not saying you're, I'm saying Tony's <laughs> fault. But, um, but that's, that's, again, what the fuck? It, they have no fucking concept of what they're doing and they've been handed a lot of shit and they've had a bunch of people pet them on the head and they've all convinced each other that they're geniuses and they're brilliant and they're the greatest wrestlers in the world. And they are to a very small subset of what's left of wrestling fandom. Everybody else thinks they're insufferable, wants them to go the fuck away. But anyway, I would I'd love to I'd love to see FTR and the Hardly Boys just just have one of those maybe reshoot Sissy Boy slap fight. That independent movie from Canada that we've all had fun watching over and over again on YouTube. I encourage everybody check it out. A great co-star in it, a guy named Tyson Smith. But I'd like to see them reenact Sissy Boy slap fight. I'd like to see old Maddie and Nikki Slap Dax and Cash one time, and I'd like to see the fucking receipt. And I guarantee you, if the Bucks didn't already have kids, if they did have some more, they'd be born fucking dizzy. 
Anyway, so that was this week in the dramas of Romper Room. I, I, where do you think we're going from here? Who's going to crack up next? Yeah, I'm not saying this with a smile on my face or anything, but actually, I think Tony. I think Tony could be nothing but overwhelmed if we just look at everything going well, considering everything on his plate. And right now, he's got more drama backstage than when Cody was there, because a lot of that was kind of like a, a Cold War <laughs> at times. <laughs> this is a little more open and hostile, obviously. And it's I getting bet, out of I the bet, air. I bet Cody was proactive in trying to be a, an EVP and trying to do talent relations and trying to talk to more people, because he is the type of person that would take that job and its responsibilities fairly seriously, where these other jack-offs just want to do the video game. So we'll see. Yeah. Anyway. 